who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he who, I'm sorry, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God bless you. Clearly, this is, well, let me ask it this way. This, this verse here, verse 30, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How do we understand that, that verse in light of who we are as the church? Sure, Loretta. Test. Yes. Which, which verse are you reading? 30. 30, okay. You say, and so this good for nothing <laughs> slave into the outer darkness. Throw this good for nothing what? Huh? Slave. slave. This good for nothing slave into outer darkness. That indicated to me that the, the master was not pleased with He what was not he pleased. He was not talent. pleased. Yeah, that's good. That there is this sense of expectation that his slave or servant should have done something. Should have done what? Should have done what? Invested. Should have expanded the kingdom. He had the time. He had the talent, right? He had the treasure. He had the ability, I'm, I'm saying, but he also had the master's uh, talent or money to be able to do that, but he didn't. And how should we understand this verse in light of the church? What we've done throughout this section, we've been talking about stewardship, our stewardship. And we've made application from the principles that are in this, this uh, parable. Question is, how do we apply this verse in light of the church? When the scripture says, cast that unprofitable servant or that good for nothing good for nothing slave into outer darkness. How do we understand this verse? Sheila, you had your hand up. Well, I was thinking about not so much the casting out, mm. but what he did. Um, mm -hmm. The church should see that as sin. Number one, when God gives us ability uh -huh. to handle the treasure, okay. and we don't uh, invest it in the kingdom, first of all, so one, one of the principles we, we take from, from this verse is to see the failure of believers to use our time, talent, and treasure for the expansion of the kingdom. That's a sin. A sin. That's a sin. Okay, good. Um, the casting out, mm -hmm. we can never be cast out. Okay. Because um, Ephesians, I believe mm -hmm. it's one somewhere between mm -hmm. 3 and 14 tells us we've been sealed mm -hmm. by the Spirit. And another scripture tells us that no one can pluck us out of the hand mm -hmm. of God. But it does, it may be a brokenness in terms of not so much as our relationship, but mm -hmm. our fellowship. Sure. And that we are open to God's chastisement. Good, good. Um, which is is done to bring us out of that slowfulness mm -hmm. and for correction. Okay. Like that. Okay. Good. That that um, th there will come this time. I, I think you said. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There'll come a time where the Christian will be chastised. Chastised. Disciplined. Mm -hmm. And now I. I'm just thinking loss of rewards. Okay, good. For good. in terms of you know um, not doing the work. Good, good. There'll come a time in in our experience one that God chastises us, which imp implies that He He holds us accountable for what we're doing and not doing. And then there is the ultimate accountability. What is the ultimate accountability? I think you, you mentioned that, right? The loss of reward. That's right. But there, there's a loss, possible loss of rewards. But the ultimate accountability is, look at 2 Corinthians. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes, yes. So the ultimate accountability, 
as Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Sheila said, there is no permanent casting. God bless you, sir. No permanent throwing away. The, um, the Lord doesn't look at us as, uh, as uh, wicked, as being wicked that is not his. We're his children, and yet there is a sense that we can be real sloppy and dirty and and um, un unprofitable, and he doesn't cast his children into outer darkness. Outer darkness is what? It's hell. That, that's, that, that place that is, is away from God's presence, and there'll never come a time where he will cast his people, his, his children, out of his presence. Not that we don't deserve it. Let me ask you, do you deserve it? <laughs> we all we all deserve hell. We we do no without question. But it's by His grace and mercy that that He has saved us, and now we're His children. So He doesn't cast us into outer darkness. But what this this Matthew twenty five illustrates is that there is that which is in God that He holds people accountable. Here in this text, I think specifically. It's, it's looking at Israel and those who are in Israel and who never come to, to um, a faith in the Messiah that they will be cast out. But in terms of applying the principle, how do we apply it to the church? Well, to the church, we're to learn that there is a day of accounting. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And somebody read for me, please. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's start reading at verse 6, 6 through, six through 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 11. And what, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a text that will help us to understand what's going to happen to us. Thanks, Un, unsaved people who come, who stand before God, unsaved people who stand before God, as, as um, um, Loretta said, as what, what did he call what the whole good, good for nothing. Unsaved people who stand before God as good for nothing um, slaves, slaves who've done nothing with the, the gifts that God has given them. In other words, they've never come to faith. They never took advantage of the opportunity to come and, and invest in the kingdom, as it were, through Jesus Christ. He's going to cast them into the outer darkness. But what happens to us as believers? Do we get a do we get a pass in terms of in terms of examination and accountability? No, we don't get a pass there. We get a pass from hell. <laughs> we get a pass from out of darkness, not because we don't deserve it, but because Christ died. He took our, our, our judgment, ultimate judgment. But he does hold us accountable. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting with verse 6. Verse 6 says, mm -hmm. Therefore, being mm -hmm. always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Okay. At home in the body means what? At home in the body. We're still living. Right. So we're still in the body, at home in the body, and absent from the Lord. What do you mean? I thought I'm with, Jesus is with me all the time. What? what? Not in the presence, in the in the visual experience, the presence of Jesus Christ. We're Glory. absent in that sense. But yes, he's living in us. Go on, Kevin. For we walk by faith, mm -hmm. not by sight. We are of good courage. Confident. I say, mm -hmm. and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. How many is, of you is that true? Is that true of let's 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 get a bus and, and let's line up and, and get ready to go home to be with the Lord. Who's going? Amen. <laughs> right? right. Paul says, I would rather, right? I'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. 
that's an interesting because it sounds like he's ready even now in this yeah. moment. Yeah. And really the pressing issue for all of us, is this true of us? I mean, right now, this moment, would you be ready to be absent? And to be absent means what? To die. Yeah. Give up, another way of saying it, give up the ghost. <laughs> right? Giving up the spirit, the life as we know it. Would you be willing right now to take that, that, uh, that, that trip that takes you out of this world into the presence of Jesus? Paul says, I'd rather. This is what I would prefer. And, and what a challenge for all of us that hopefully we're not clinging to this world so vigorously that we're not willing to let it go. Is there anything that keeps you, that has your heart so gripped in, in, in its clutches, anything that has, has your heart so bound that you're not ready right now to let it go and say I'd rather be in his presence. That's, that's where Paul wants us. He wants us there. Um, and, and he's encouraging. He's encouraging us. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent. And he, so he speaks really for, for all, all believers, particularly the second um, Corinthian, uh, Church of Corinth. He says, we are confident. So hopefully that, that's our, our, our press, our desire to be in his presence. But look at verse 9. You want to go on reading, Kathy? Forgive Therefore, me for running on like that. We also have mm -hmm. as our ambition, whether at home or absent, mm -hmm. to be pleasing to him. Uh -huh. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed mm -hmm. for his deeds in the body Amen. according to what he has done whether good or bad. Amen. And here in verse 9, we make it our aim mm -hmm. that whether present or absent, whether alive or dead, depending on how you want to look at it, present with the Lord or absent from the Lord, our aim is to be what? Well-pleasing. Well-pleasing to him. Well-pleasing looks like what? If we go back to the parable, Matthew 25, what does well-pleasing look like? Servants, good. Profitable. 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 Regardless of your, your skill level, regardless of your gifts, that you have brought profit, right, to the kingdom. That's what pleases him, well-pleasing, that you've taken what he has put in your hands and your ability, time, talent, treasure, and you've used it to expand the kingdom. Well-pleasing. Paul says, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing. And why? Why should we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to the Lord? Verse 10 says, for. The word for gives what? Reason. The reason. It states the reason why we should be well-pleasing. For, we must what? Yeah. Appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word judgment in, in, the, uh, in, in the Greek comes from uh, one, one word, actually is the word chrysis, chrysis. And we, we, we get our English word crisis. <laughs> to stand before the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a time of crisis. If we're not, if we're not prepared, it will be a huge crisis for many who will stand before him. Look at this. The judgment seat of Christ so that each one may, may receive things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So based upon what we've done in our body, whether it's good or bad, we're going to receive from, from the Lord rewards. And therefore, knowing this, the terror... We persuade men. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. See, there's a crisis coming, yes, even for believers. And Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that God has a side to him, a phase in his, in his personhood, in his personality, that he can bring terror. He can terrorize those who stand before him unprepared, whether, whether the ungodly, or whether the saved. I, I think when, when we look in, in, in Revelation, 
I think in Revelation, the Bible says he will wipe away all tears. I'm, 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 I suspect that those tears are coming as a result of being in, in the presence at the judgment seat. That crisis has brought, I, I suspect, to many a believer, especially those who are losing rewards, it's going to bring a, a great sense of, of shame, remorse, regret. But yet, in his mercy and grace, he does what? He wipes away, wipes away the tears. Great. Now, with that in mind, go with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So what we're doing, we're making application of the parable. The parable in Matthew 25. We see in the parable that he cast the unprofitable, the un, un, a good-for-nothing slave. He cast that slave into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Clearly, Jesus was using that parable to teach the nation of Israel that a day is coming when they will stand before God, before the Lord Jesus, and give answer for their, their opportunities that they either took advantage of or didn't uh, take advantage of. The nation of Israel is going to have to give an answer to God. But the parable we can learn some things for us in terms of our stewardship. And that's really what we're looking, looking at. To be a steward of God means that we are essentially living our lives according to his law, his law or his principle, that we're advancing the kingdom of God with our lives, all that we have for his glory, because it, it really is his. So we've sort of extracted some principles from Matthew 25, and now we're applying it to the church. And this is what awaits you and I as believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's start reading at verse 5. Somebody is going to read for us, starting with verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who then, who then is Paul? Mm -hmm. And who is Apollos? but ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos, I planted Apollos water, mm -hmm. but God gave the increase. Mm -hmm. So then neither he who plants is anything mm -hmm. nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Mm -hmm. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Paul is attempting to correct the thinking and behavior of the Corinthians who had set themselves up in, in uh, S-E-C-T-S, sex, S-E-C-T-S, groups, cohorts, Apollos group against Paul's group. Th so they were in... Th these groups were in, in conflict between each other in the church. And Paul calls them carnal. Look, look at verse 1. And I, brothers, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as what? Carnal. Babes in Christ. See, when we divide ourselves, what are we doing? What is that? That's carnality. That's living, that's living according to the principles of the flesh. The flesh wants to be divisive. It sets us against each other, me against you, him against her. It, it, just, it just does that. And if ever you're wondering if you are carnal, is, is there something that separates you from a brother or sister? <laughs> Anything. I, I don't know. Nah, see, see, the... the Principle is, is that we're one in Christ, correct? What is it that makes us one? His death, his blood. Christ's blood, his death puts us in the body. We are one. So nothing has any value beyond the death and the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Not, not, not nationality, not ethnicity, not color of skin, not... not um, where we worship, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, that, that should not separate us. Paul says, 
I planted, Apollos watered, but it's God who did what? God made this thing work. And, and then he goes on, now he who plants and he who waters are one. But I'm sorry, I missed one. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters. See, these, these uh, uh, groups think that they, they have an edge on, on the other group. Oh, I'm better than you. Oh, I've got, I've got this. I remember years ago, and, and, and it, it still goes on, it still rages, the issue of, of the tongues. Right. I felt so out of place because I didn't know any better that I think I shared this story with you. Right? That in in the church, I was uh, Kathy uh, Olivet. Yeah. And, and th th there came about in, in the church at some time. Uh, there were some saints there who were uh, promoting this tongues thing and char the charismatic movement, quote unquote. And, and I felt so out of it, so out of the, the loop. Because I, I just never, I never, and still haven't, spoken in tongues. And I just felt like, wow, God, you, yeah, wh why am I so different? Am I really saved? You know, that's, that's where it led me. That's where it led me. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying it's that kind of contention that can separate and cause harm to other believers. Where, whereas... What we ought to look at, we're nothing. We're nothing. He who waters, he who um, plants is nothing. Ultimately, the glory belongs to, if we keep our eyes on Jesus and not on, not on what he's doing, she's doing, what, but that's, that's what robs God of his glory. Carol. I have a very similar. Did you really? Good morning, everybody. What, you, you, were speaking in, you were speaking in tongues, too? You know I'm playing with you, Carol. Um, I had just gotten saved. God bless you. Just gotten saved uh -huh. and had gone to a church service. And um, then I saw some young women that were saved on the same evening that I, you know, mm -hmm. that I confessed Christ. And um, they were speaking in tongues and, and shouting. I said, and I said, oh, Lord, you know, am I really saved? You mm -hmm. know, and um, for a long while, you know. Well, not for a long while, mm -hmm. but when I really got some place where I was really able to understand mm -hmm. and learn, mm -hmm. I said, you know, I realized that that wasn't yeah. uh, the fact that I wasn't saved. That was something that the, the flesh, right. the Carnality. flesh was mad, you know. Yeah. But for a, a good moment, oh, yeah. I did. I said, I oh, know the feeling. Did I miss something, Lord? Yeah. 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 And sometimes, and it's, it's I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it's confusing to it is. young babes. It you know? is. Yeah. Sometimes it, it may not be something like, like the tongues issue. Sometimes it, it could be the approach we have to the uh, understanding scripture. And sometimes we put ourselves in different camps in terms of how we interpret and understand scripture. And we shouldn't, you know, uh, be put off by someone who comes along and, and says, for instance, um, in, for instance, in, uh, the reformed movement, which we're all part of, but in the reformed movement, some in that movement don't believe that there is a literal millennium, that it's figurative. But we, as the way we interpret scripture is that the millennium, the thousand year rule of Jesus is a literal kingdom on the earth. So what does that mean? Those who don't believe the millennial um, or who who don't believe in in the pre-trib uh, rapture or post-trib and all of these groups that means we shouldn't get a no of course we ought to get along because we're saved in christ the one thing that unites us is the blood of christ and what shouldn't divide us is, is our theology or our eschatology how we look at at uh, in interpretive issues but but with all that, sometimes what divides us is are these issues that are, and what divides us, that's carnality. If it divides us, it's carnality. But look at what Paul says. If you'll go on, um, Steve, and re read on. Look, look at verse 3. For we are what? Where we at? Yeah, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, and I think we stopped at verse 8. Now, he who plants and he who waters is one. 
and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And now verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. Fellow workers. You are God's field. Mm -hmm. You are God's building. Mm -hmm. According to the grace of God, which, mm -hmm. which was given to me as a wise master builder, mm -hmm. I have laid. Mm -hmm. Oh, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation mm -hmm. and another builds on it. But let each one take heed now he builds on it. Oh, excuse me. Let each one take heed how he builds on mm -hmm. it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. Amen. Let each one. Which is Jesus we, Christ. Amen. Let's pause just for a moment. Let each one take heed how he builds. Let's just unpack that just a little. Clearly, the work is ours. We are, Paul says, we are what? Co-laborers or, or what? We're, we're fellow workers, right? Together with God. Yes. You are God's field and, and you are God's building. And according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. What is he saying? Unpack that. Paul says, I laid the foundation and another is building on it. But let each one take heed. Take heed. What, what are we talking about here? Hmm? Um, take heed, yeah. How he builds on the building. What, what's the building? What's the building? Look, look, at, look at the text. It says, again, right. I have laid the foundation, another builds on it. I'm sorry, look, look at uh, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. What is the building? Which is what? The church. And he says, let each one take heed how he does what? Builds on it. The foundation. The foundation was laid by the apostles. Christ is that foundation. And the church is the building. And each one needs to take heed how he's building on it, which is how he is doing what in concerning the church? How he's using his time, talent, and treasure to expand the kingdom by building on the church or in the church, helping the church to what? Grow. Take heed. Be aware that we need to be careful to make sure that we're building in a way that will expand the, the church, the, the move of God through the church. Look at how Paul says this, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Don't try to change the foundation. Don't, don't take Christ out of, out of his central place in terms of the church. The church is founded on Jesus Christ. In, in Roman Catholicism, the, the foundation shifted. It, it's shared. The foundation of the church is shared with the Pope. Why do I say that? Because the authority is not exclusively, does not exclusively in Roman Catholicism, the authority they believe in the earth for the church is through the Pope. Yeah, in Roman Catholicism. Yeah, they, they think the authority of, of Christ and the authority of the church comes by way of what the Pope says. What do we believe in Protestant in the Protestant movement? The authority comes from the word. And, and that, yeah, Jesus expresses his authority through his word. And what we're, we're not, we're not sharing, or Christ doesn't share his authority with pope, priest, pastor, potentate, people. Any other P's out there? No, nobody. He does not share. It's got to be exclusively his, his and, and his alone. He's the foundation. Don't change that. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with what? What are those? Gold, silver, and precious stones. What are gold, silver, and precious stones? What are those? What are those? Gold, silver, and precious stones. What are those? Mm -hmm. Precious ores and metals. Gold, silver, and precious stones. Any, anybody wearing gold rings? Silver? 
Do you have any any uh, precious stones, rubies, gems, right? What what what's how are they different? Gold, silver, precious stones. Think think about the gold. What has more value, gold, silver, or precious stones? The gold. And what's next? Silver. And what's next? Precious stone. So he rates, he gives value to the gold. Some, some are, are building and adding to the foundation of the church by using their gifts. And the gold has seemingly has more value than the silver. Principle. Go back with me to Matthew 25. What do we learn in Matthew 25? The talents. Did he give all the same talent? No, he didn't. Some he gave two. I'm sorry, five. First one he gave five. Second one he gave two. The third one he gave one. We see similar thinking in, in terms of the gold, silver, and precious stone. That based on our ability, some are able to give and, and expand the kingdom with gold. Some with silver. Some with precious stone. Value. Value. Gold, silver, precious stone. But then there are these others. Look look at this. Read on for us, please. Now, if anyone yeah. builds on this foundation with gold, silver, or precious stone, think about this too. The gold has a higher density, a greater density, and it doesn't, it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't lose its value as quickly as the silver. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think the silver is a softer metal than the gold, right? So in terms of fire, the silver melts a lot quicker than the gold and, and so on. So, and, and what is, what, and we're going to see why the fire is so important. But look, look again at the verse, verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, then he adds three more. What are those three? Wood, hay, and straw. Wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will become what? Clear. Clear. For the day, what's the day? The, Lord's day? the judgment seat, when we will stand before Jesus, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by what? Fire will determine the value of our work. Now we're looking at gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw. Let's talk about the last three. Wood, hay, and straw. What's, what's going on there? Degrees. Uh-huh. Good. They will burn easily. Well, let me ask you this. Of the three, wood, hay, and straw, what's going to burn quicker? The straw. The straw. The straw. It's just like you the straw. Yeah. It has nothing inside of it. Right. Burn, right. Stuff. Like they were, you had wheat. It's with, with all of the nutrients right. extracted. Right. You just had the shaft. Right. So that's straw. Easily. So the wood is going to burn slower. The hay, a little slower, but what burns the fastest? The straw. So these degrees, are, they're, they're degrading, uh, less, they're more uh, susceptible to the fire. What's the fire in this context? What is, what is the fire in this context? Because it will be revealed by fire. Fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Fire indicates what, what Jesus will use to test to test the works that we, we've uh, um, accumulated over time. And fire always points to his judgment. His judgment. It's the day of judgment. In fact, um, the, the, the idea of, of fire, this is his method so that you and I can prepare ourselves for that day. For the day will declare it of what sort it is, what kind of work we've been doing. So, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. Hmm. Do you want to wait until the day? <laughs> I know the day will declare it, but do you want to wait until 
the day to discover that all you've done since you've been saved is wood, hay, and straw. No, I, I just don't think that, that that's the best approach. I think the best approach, and that's why he's writing this, to warn believers, to prepare themselves, to make sure, that's why he said, let each one take heed how he builds. Take heed. Examine yourselves to see how you, what materials are you using. Gold, silver, or precious stone, or is it wood, hay, and straw? Let's read on, because I think more information is going to help us understand and discern the kind of materials we're using. Look at verse, uh, where are we, verse 14? We, uh, we are mm -hmm. halfway between, mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, mm -hmm. and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, mm -hmm. yet so as through fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gold, silver, and precious stone will endure the fire, but the wood, but the wood hay, and stubble. Is going to what? It's going to, it's going to burn up. But you will be saved. So it's possible that many, many of us, are, I, I, yeah, if we're saved, we're saved, right? So it's possible that as saved people that will stand in his presence, praise be to God, but it's possible what I think I'm reading is that we'll stand in his presence and some of us won't have anything worthy of our time, worthy of his glory for the time that we spent as saints. All we, all we can offer him is wood, hay, and stubble that, that will not pass the, the test of fire. What is this examination? What will he use? What will he use as the test, whether it's gold, silver, or precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble? What will he use? Sister Vine. Good. Good. Every bit of that. It's what we do. Say it again, Sister Bonnie. Is it what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Why are we doing it? Good. And how often are we doing it? Good. Very good. What we're doing, why we're doing it, and, and perhaps how often. And how. How we're doing it, what we're doing, how often, and why. Good questions. Go back with me now to the parable, 25, um, in Matthew 25. In the parable, we had, we had the man who had five, we had the man who had two, and we had the man who had one. The man who had one, which, is he gold, silver, or precious stone? None of them. He's wood, hay, and stubble. And why is he, why would you, why would you say that? And you know what you're doing? Now, now look, at what, look at what we're doing. Look at what we're doing. We're examining him. <laughs> right? Now, how are we examining him? What are we using to examine this man who did what? He hid his, his talent. How are we, what are we using to examine him? The word. And, and what's, what's the, the, the questions we're, we're answering? What are the questions that we're answering? Uh-huh. He gave good. Good. And he was responsible to use them. Good. So he didn't obey what the Lord told Good. Very good. So we, we really are answering the questions that Bonnie asked and, and this is Sheila. What did he do? How did he do it? How often did he do it? And why did he do it? And the answer is? He didn't do nothing. He didn't. And, and he, in terms of motivation, he had none. He hid it. Instead of even doing something, he hid. He, he was wicked and he's, he was lazy. So he was unmotivated, unimpressed with his master. 
Is that possible that saints can be unimpressed with Jesus? Can, can you imagine that? What is it, what is it that, that would keep any saint from being impressed with Jesus to the point that they're not motivated to expand his glory and his kingdom? What is it that hinders um, believers from... Okay, I'm sorry. Wow. The worth, the worth of Christ, of their salvation. They don't understand the worth, the value of their salvation. What is it that blinds believers to the value of their salvation? I can only say ignorance. It could, it could be, be ignorance. ignorance. And, and you know what? It's hard. It's hard for me to use the word saint and and blind to their to the worth of their salvation because in my mind if you honestly call let me put it go back if you honestly understood the gospel <laughs> mm -hmm. and you and you you realized you were deserving of hell and Christ died for your sins mm -hmm. and you escaped the wrath of God in my mind I can't understand why a person is just not thankful for the fact that they escaped hell. And I mean, whatever you want me to do, hey, I'll do it because this thing is just so great. You know, I'm just, I'm yours. That's that's just the, that's my mind. I, I got a word for you. Yes. Or actually, it's not my word. It's what Paul said. Paul said, I couldn't. See, you speak like a spiritual person. But Paul said, I couldn't. I couldn't talk to you about spiritual things. Because what? Carnal. They were carnal. And they didn't value spiritual things because of what? Carnality. Carnality will eat up your and my perception of spiritual things. It will reduce it to zero. Zeta, nada, zilch, nothing. It will just eat it up. Wood, hay, and stubble. Carnality just removes it, it exchanges the value of who Christ is, what he has done, and we measure it by carnal, carnal standards. What, what brings me pleasure, comfort, ease, and satisfaction? That's what eats the value of, of the glory of Jesus Christ in, in the mind of the believer. Sure, Jill. Help me with this. Sure. Because I, I need help with this. Paul, Paul's going to help you how out. How in the world? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out um, how in the world a person, and I mm -hmm. understand carnality. Sure. But, but what happens? Mm -hmm. What happens between the time they receive Jesus Christ to get them into that state of mind? I, I want to know what, you understand what I'm saying, Pastor? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know what? Um, Pastor Kevin has his hand up. Paul? Mm -hmm. uh, some people get saved and then the the troubles, the mm -hmm. things that happen in the world mm -hmm. take over mm -hmm. and takes their mind off mm -hmm. of Jesus mm -hmm. and on to self. Mm -hmm. And selfishness is the one thing that gets you in trouble. Right, yeah. Either selfishness from the standpoint of worrying about daily things yeah. or going after treasure. Mm -hmm. Or trying to please the flesh. Right. Any right. of those distracts you from Jesus. Right. And that's how a person who can be saved right. can find themselves mm -hmm. in disobedience. Yeah. Because life, I mean, life takes over. It does. Yeah. For some people. I mean, for if you're some. not careful, there's always something that's going to come up to draw your focus elsewhere. Absolutely. And and we as spiritual saints are always contending. The, against the flesh, always. And there's a reason. You better fight it. <laughs> you don't fight it, that flesh will eat you up. The, and when we talk about flesh, that's carnal. It's the principle of living according to the flesh. And, and it's no more than, than what, what is, is the sin principle. The sin principle uses the flesh to express itself. Paul said in Romans, I think it's Romans 8, Help, help me, Michael. He said in Romans 8, 
8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but according to what? The spirit. Two, two principles, two diverse principles by which we, we should, we, we realize that we're in contention. It's the principle of, of life um, in Christ Jesus and the principle of carnality and the flesh. And the Bible says in Romans 8 that the, the carnal mind, the carnal mind is enmity. It's at war with God. The spirit of God is saying, David, I need you. I need you praying. The carnal mind resists that. Now, um, you thought I was talking about this David, right? It's this other, this other David I know. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm just saying, it's, it's, it's a constant. It's a constant battle, a warfare that you and I are engaged in. And it, it, will, it is unrelenting. It will not ease up. The day you think you can, oh soul, be at ease, like, like the, the parable of Jesus, you, you, you've just lost. You've just lost yourself over to the impulses of the flesh. So we're, we're constantly at war. And if we're, not, if we're not in pursuit of, as Scripture says in Romans 8, if we're not in pursuit of the, the principles of the, the, the spirit, then, then we're going to succumb to the carnality. Go ahead, Michael. You were going to um, finish up. Mm -hmm. No, please do. Please do. Yeah. Romans 8, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Just starting in verse 5. For, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Wow. Now, now can we pause you? Those that live according to the principles of the flesh, what have they done? They have set their minds on what? Things of the flesh. On the things of the flesh. What keeps, what was your question again, Sheila? What, what happens when you spend your time living through the How do, yeah, how do saints get there? How do we, is, is it a drift? Or is it, is it, is it a blowout? You know, you hit a nail and, and that tire, poof. Or is it a slow leak? Tends to be what? A, more of a drift. Sure, Pastor Mike. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a drift, mm. and I forget the, uh, the Greek word there mm -hmm. for set your mind. Wow, okay. But it has a sense of mm -hmm. going after Isn't that amazing? the flesh, seeking after. Wow. Not just, you know, it's not passive, mm -hmm. it's an aggressive wow. approach to what going after a description. the flesh. An aggressive approach. Yeah to the flesh. So it's interesting when he mm -hmm. reads the, mm -hmm. the rest of that. The, okay, good. good. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Wow. Let's, let's open that up. And all in answer to, to Sheila's question, how do we get there? How is it that saints can drift there, can get there? And, and Pastor Michael said that there is this um, aggressive, what did you say? Seeking after. And, and what on the opposite side, you've got the spirit, those who set their minds on the things of the spirit, what are they doing there? They're aggressively seeking after. So both, both are exercising a, a kind of passion and, and energy toward what they want, but one saint is in pursuit of the spirit, setting his mind to aggressively approach the things of the spirit. Another saint sets his mind to approach the things aggressively to approach the things of, of uh, carnality. And it really is just that simplistic, simple. What are you setting your mind on? What have you made your mind up to do? That That's what it gets down to. Sister Bonnie, that's what it gets down to. Say it again. Say it again, dear. Egypt. Wow. So when, okay, now, now you're pulling in Old Testament, the, the Israelites who were set free, going to Canaan, they run into some hard times, but, but what is it? What is it? Now they want to go back to Egypt. So they're in hard times. The hard times now 
has caused them to yearn for what they what they lost in in Egypt. What what how would you describe in a word? How would you describe that mindset? Pastor, I think when um, mm -hmm. we if we're poorly taught, we believe once we become saved, mm -hmm. life is going to be a bed of roses. Nah, somebody and somebody lying to me. Everything you right. want <laughs> is just going to fall into place. <laughs> Uh -huh. And when that mm. does not happen, right. we start looking back. Yeah. Like, I didn't have this problem right. or this work, this problem wasn't that bad. Right. And now, look at me. Yeah. Good. Good. That's carnality. That is carnality. That that's the the uh the mind being overwhelmed. And and maybe it is the struggle, maybe it is the uh temptation, maybe it is the 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 pain of suffering. Maybe it is the um, the the, um, the struggle we have with with relationships that take us to yearn to go back. It it could very well be, and and all of it if we're not walking after principles of spirit, then it's it's carnality. Sure, Pastor um, um, Kevin. Well, we we also live at a time where people have tried to take the gospel to mm. twist it mm. into this prosperity ministry. Wow where it's all about me mm -hmm. and what I can get. Mm. I, I always say it's like people have taken God and turned him to this giant ATM machine. Wow. Thinking that, that you know, it becomes, they say they're worshiping mm -hmm. God, but it's mm -hmm. for selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. It's believing that everything they want, they're going to get. Yeah. Kind of as a trade-off mm -hmm. for believing. Mm -hmm. And that still is carnality because it's about your own desire. Yeah. And not about him. Good. Good. Very good. Carnality is, is what keeps uh, saints from, from really expressing and expanding the kingdom. Sister Davis, please. I just want to say, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Good, good, good. And, and what, are, what are you seeing there? My people perish. For the, was that Amos? Yeah, ignorant. I can't okay. recall what scripture, okay. but... The word of God mm -hmm. says, yeah, mm -hmm. my people perish mm -hmm. for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, in Israel days, especially, you know, they weren't uh, applying God's word. They mm -hmm. didn't know. Good. And today, Good. people do not know mm -hmm. the word of God. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ignorance out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's flourishing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I just think uh, um, we, we perish either because we don't know, we're in ignorance, not knowing, and that's not an excuse, by the way. It's not a reason um, to um, that excuses our carnality. It's it's uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of a lot of saints sort of rest in that um, and not pursuing truth. In fact, the Bible says, "Grow in grace and in the what knowledge. knowledge of our Lord and Savior." So we're we're responsible for using our time, talent, and treasure to expand the kingdom. Our knowledge of, of God's will. And Pastor, it's sure. also uh, the reason why things should be witnessing more. Witnessing more? Yeah, because uh, people don't know. Good. And, and the reason they don't know is because the church hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Possibly, yes. Possibly, Possibly. yeah. yeah. I go back to mm -hmm. um, Holman's. Uh, Holman's Christian, Christian standard. Right. Sister Loretta. Loretta said, mm -hmm. good for nothing. Mm -hmm. The Bible says lazy. And it's just what you were saying. Mm -hmm. My mind went back to Ephesians, mm -hmm. where Paul was praying for the Ephesian saints mm -hmm. that that they would know. First of all, he prayed that they would mm. be given a spirit of oh, Lord, wisdom. Tried, wisdom and revelation. Spiritual wisdom and understanding, understanding and the knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. That the eyes of, of understanding being be enlightened. enlightened that mm -hmm. they may know what is the hope of, of their call. his call. Mm -hmm. Not our call, but okay. the calling that God put on our lives. Mm -hmm. What are the riches of the glory? Inherit. But um, mm -hmm. getting back to what I want to say mm -hmm. is, what he's praying is effort on our part. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Christ, all I wanted, my Bible looked like, uh, look worse than this. Falling apart, right? Right, because I was just, I wanted to know what was in it. Mm -hmm. And I just kept reading and reading and reading. And then it got to a point in my life where, well, I knew surfacely mm -hmm. what it said. Mm -hmm. But when I got to 
phrases like hope of his calling, mm-hmm. Israel of God. I kept on saying, what is that? Mm-hmm. What is that? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. But it was okay when I was reading it. Right. But now I'm trying to understand, understand it. it. Right. So that took effort. Oh, yeah. That took time. It does. That took discipline. Mm-hmm. That took sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And so when we're lazy Christians, we don't want to put the time in. It's one thing coming here and hearing you preach, we eat, but somebody said, what is it? You can teach a person, you can you can feed them for a day. You said it mm-hmm. downstairs. Mm-hmm. You can feed them for a day, and I used it too, but when you teach them how to fish, mm-hmm. he can eat for life. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that I am an excellent Bible student because I'm not, yeah, but thank yeah. God for, you know, the internet. Mm-hmm. So many people tools. People I can go to, right. this, that, and the other. I can dig. And if I still don't understand, mm-hmm. I can ask. Mm-hmm. And that will enlighten me. Mm-hmm. And that will allow me to apply to know, you know, how great God is that my life has been preordained before the foundation of the world, laid out. Right. And if I desire to walk in the will of God, mm-hmm. you know, I seek his face, cry up unto him and he gives me the strength everything i need Mm -hmm. everything i need so i do think it's ignorance Mm -hmm. it's laziness Mm -hmm. we we just have to step up our game that's all yeah yeah. as christians yeah and the whole whole um discussion has been centered around this idea of we as saints and believers that we have a day of accounting that we, we will give an account to god to jesus christ paul says second corinthians we're confident. In, in fact, he goes on to say that all of us will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's for believers. Believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If, if, you're, if you're thinking you're a believer and you're standing at the great white throne, you, you've missed an opportunity by a thousand years. Yeah, the great white throne judgment is reserved for the lost. Saints will not be at the great white throne. Saints will be judged at the, at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And it's very selective. Saints, believers. And what we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is wait until that day to determine whether or not, um, you know, our, our, our works are, are profitable. We, we want to do everything we can now, today, as Bonnie uh, asked those questions, motivated properly, and how, you know, be consistent in our, in our pursuit of God's will, using our gifts to expand the glory of God and, and where and how and why, we, why we're doing what we're doing. We really, we really have an opportunity, and this, this is an open window for us, an opportunity for us to expand the kingdom. Jesus said it this way, work while it is, for the night is coming. Well, you can't work. And you will not be able to work. Sister Sheila and uh, then um, Pastor uh, Bill will word, close us out. The word risk that stays in my mind. The, the word what? Risk. Risk. Being a risk. person takes risk. A risk. Okay. Risk. Mm-hmm. They can, uh-huh. Somehow I think there's, there's a lot of people like that. They're not ready to risk their life in having faith in Christ. Mm. And following whatever principle yeah. takes to that thing. Yeah. We're, we're not risk takers. Yeah. And excellent it, it, point. We're, we're just not there. Excellent I'm not saying point. much, but others. Mm-hmm. So when others yeah. upset, you're not ready to make him the center of our life. Yeah. Because that's a risk. That's great, a risk that's great turning point. it all over, surrendering it all. Yeah. That's, that's another right. issue all of us contend with. Yes. Because that's we want we want comfort. Yes. Yes. We, we do. We, we just want comfort. We're not ready to give up that But we've got to push past <laughs> comfort. Yes. And, and yeah, take, be, a risk. take a risk. Take a risk. For, because he calls us to sacrifice. Yes, he doesn't call us to uh, comfort and ease right. and give him what you can afford right. or give yeah. him what you have left all. over or give him your spare. Right. He, he wants what? He wants it all. He wants it all. He, he wants, wants the best. He wants the best. He wants the best. And yes. that, that's yes. sacrifice. That takes risk that we trust him with, with all of our time, talent, and treasure. And Pastor Bill. Instead of waiting until that last day. Good. Um, the, the scripture has an ammunition for it. Okay. Doing. Okay. Uh, Hebrews uh, 10, 24, 25. Mm-hmm. He says, and let us consider one another. Consider one another. To provoke, provoke one another. Unto to provoke unto love and to good, good works. works. 
uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, mm. but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. Why, why would he exhort? Why should we exhort one another to um, spend more time together? Because he did, he said um, that that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Exactly. And do you know that that is one of the ways that saints slowly drift yes. Yes. away from Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. It's being comfortable with not being around the people of God. And if if I take, I, I know, I know this. If I take one day off. I'm, I'm not satisfied. I want, I want, it's easier than next one. And it's easier than next one. It just is. And, and what we ought to do is when we're seeing that, that trend in, in my life, I know what Bill's going to do. I know what Pastor Bill's going to do. He's going he gonna to pick up that phone. Today, day, where you been, bro? Where you, where, where? I'm missing days in action. And that's what we ought to do. Exhort one another. Provoke one another. We absolutely ought to. Because we don't want to see our brothers and sisters drift away. So be mindful of that when we're looking at empty seats. It's something going on in the lives of saints. If, if they're not consistently and faithfully attending to spiritual things, and a great sign is how, how frequently are they attending a church. Huge, huge sign that something's awry. And what, what that leads to is decline in spiritual things, carnality, and therefore their works will be what? Wood, hay, and stubble. They'll absolutely have, at some point, they'll keep losing rewards and, and stand before Jesus and have nothing to offer. Yeah, that, that's where, where we've been, uh, what we've been looking at over the past few weeks. Let's, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the, um, the caution and the call of the Spirit of God to be faithful. And we realize that there is a crisis appointed for each of us, that one day we will stand in your presence. And, and actually, uh, we, we don't have to uh, imagine. The day is coming. Your word says it. And, and we humble ourselves now and just confess our own failure in so many ways to be fruitful and to expand the kingdom. Forgive us for our silence. Forgive us for our laziness. Forgive us for our carnality. Wash us. And we thank you again for this assembly, this place where, where you, you call saints, you call saints to, to give an account, to be faithful. And we thank you for men of the Bible. Bless the remainder of this day as we seek to give you glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, saints. Thank you so much for your time.